Everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Consumer Fi Podcast. We are joined today by Jose Mendiola of Resolvion. Jose, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Joel. So Jose and I have been uh, kind of mixing it up a little bit uh, across uh, trade groups and, and meeting up when we're at the, the annual ARA NARS event, uh, North American Repossessor Summit of the American Recovery Association. Jose, um, for folks that, that don't know you, and I think there's that's probably a pretty small population, but for folks that don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Well, first things first, Joel, thank you for having me on and, and giving us the forum to talk shop. Uh, my background is about 25 years in auto finance, uh, started in a subprime finance company, spent uh, about 15 years there. Um, I've got uh, pretty much my, my professional career has been spent in auto finance. So anything from the management of a loan portfolio uh, on through the last decade, which has been spent more specifically managing a national forwarder and in the recovery side of the business. Um, but in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's my background. Outstanding. And, and, and the background of, of resolving on, um, as a company, you, you've, you've, you've obviously had to lead a lot of, a lot of that growth and, and the transition. Can you give us a little bit of a history of, of resolving on? Sure. Well, resolving on really is, is, the evolution of uh, of actually three companies that have come together over time, um, the oldest of which was Consumer Financial Services, a family-run business out of Shelton, Connecticut, that was in the commercial recovery space. Um, at a certain point, there was a PE group out of, uh, out of the Atlanta, Georgia area called Atlanta Equity. Uh, they bought a, uh, an interest in the firm I want to say it was in about 2009, 2010, um, right around the same time that uh, I had a startup by the name of American Lending Solutions with a couple of partners. Um, and, uh, and so we were on parallel tracks. Um, I would say American Lending Solutions spent more time on the forwarding or early stages of recovery, as well as late stage uh, pre and post charge off skip, where Resolvion. Um, uh, and Consumer Financial converted its name to Resolvion. Um, so they were primarily in the commercial space, but did have some consumer clients uh, running parallel to us. So in 2014, uh, we put those two companies together um, and, uh, and really doubled the company in size between 2014 and 2018 when we recapitalized the business, brought in a new PE group out of the uh, San Francisco area called Spanos Barber Jesse SBJ and uh, continued to grow the company and uh, we're at this point looking to uh, grow not just through organic uh, opportunities, but also what opportunities there were in the marketplace. And so we had known uh, Josh Elias and the group from Del Mar recovery out of uh, the Carlsbad San Diego area. Um, and so we put their company together with ours and they were, they were uh, headed up by a, uh, a private equity group as well called TZP. So now we're one big happy family. Uh, it's two private equity groups, um, Mike, myself, Josh. We've combined the companies and, uh, and here we are today, uh, pre-COVID, uh, managing anywhere from 60 to 70,000 uh, recovery assignments that come through the doors on a monthly basis and anywhere from 20 to 25,000 repos. Mm, outstanding. So the whole, the whole, re, the whole, the whole repo, uh, the forward, the forwarder model, um, that was something that I had to kind of wrap my head around and understand pretty early on once I got involved at the NARS conference to understand, um, just the history. And to me, you know, it's pretty simple. I, I think when you apply technology, or you apply uh, some way to kind of uh, um, add some efficiency to certain functions and remove the duplication of effort, it's obviously beneficial and the market has responded. And so the, the forwarding community has, 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 has sort of grown. And you mentioned a couple of private equity firms that are involved in the mix. And, and this is something that as you and I spoke in the earlier days, you were you were calling it out. You were forecasting there was going to be more more deals, more uh, consolidation of of companies such as yours. Um, 
at, at you know how would you kind of you know share how things have evolved within the the forwarder community and 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 what what are the things that for for finance companies or banks or, con, or credit unions that that really use it like what is what is the value prop that they're really seeing that's because obviously you're not going to grow the market un, unless you grow your revenue and you grow your customer base right right well uh i think it's important to take a step back first of all and understand um the evolution of the forwarder and 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 why they came about um and keep in mind that my my personal uh involvement on the repo side of the business has been in the last decade um I'd say the forwarding business has been around for about uh, 20 to 30 years, um, or the managed model. And uh, it really started as, as a means of getting, in fact, some of the early entrants into the, uh, the space were uh, a part of North America, which is a related company to Odessa and car auction services. And so if you think about it from that perspective of how, you know, how, how can you get more cars into the auction arena, um, Adessa, and for that matter, PAR and its evolution uh, a while back, along with uh, PK Willis and a company called American Recovery Services, I think uh, ARS started more as a traditional repo agency with a pension for skip tracing. And that's their evolution of how they started. Uh, and again, they've been around both companies for in excess of 20 to 30 years. Um, but that's if you look at it from that perspective on and again, the, the original reasons of why forwarding came about, um, the evolution really took a, I would say, a 90 degree change or turn um, as compliance started to come into the environment and the CFPB. And so while you mentioned technology and efficiencies and everything else, um, the game changer, in, in, in my opinion, really in 2000, you know, 9, 10 is when the CFPB started to make its noise about third party oversight yeah. um, and Obama administration that's coming in and making sure that uh, the debtors are being treated fairly and, and not in a disparate uh, environment, whether at the original lending level or even through the recovery process. And so... Uh, that in and of itself uh, really started a new track of compliance that lenders started to take a much keener eye to. Um, and, and in my opinion, really started the fast track of the evolution of the forwarder. When I think of those compliance aspects, and we're talking about the Dodd-Frank, uh, you know, third party oversight type thing, where the way that I boil it down is if, is if, you're, the, if, you're, if you're the holder of the paper and you've, you've utilized a third party, such as a recovery agent or, or a forwarder, uh, you're, you're on the hook for, for really whatever they do. They're, they're kind of your agent, if you will. They, they are your agent in, in, in the eyes of the law. Um, I would imagine that banks and credit unions perhaps would be the initial adopters. I would think that they would have the most forward uh, looking uh, and and relatively aggressive compliance programs was was that kind of the, the 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 initial adopters or was it like large captives or or other large finance companies? Yeah, you you no question as the pendulum swang and compliance really started uh, coming into the marketplace, um, we saw an immediate uh, heightened awareness from any one of our lenders, and, and keep in mind that. You know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. The timing of, yeah. of, of my entrance into the recovery space was right at the end of the last recession as the CFPB was starting to make its noise. And while it created uh, significant barriers to entry, if you were already inside of the marketplace and you were a professional player, mm -hmm. uh, then that allowed for the major lenders and major captives to start to understand who are the handful of players in the marketplace that I can really lean on um, in an effort to uh, to battle my my, my risk appetite? Mm -hmm. And so, no question, when you look at the big players, whether it's the captives or the major banks or the credit unions, um, the pendulum swung there first, and slowly but surely, um, you know, no different than in the world of of risk based lending, those that are in the in the business of taking additional risks or wider. Um, uh, swaths of risk may have approached it differently than, let's say, Wells Fargo Bank. Mm. So there's, you know, there's not a one size fits all here. 
but no question, the compliance aspect uh, definitely changed. Um, and there are several aspects of it that, uh, that we can get uh, more into the weeds on, um, handling of personal property and different aspects of it. But the bottom line is as compliance, um, the bar got that raised, um, the first adopters of it were definitely the major players, but uh, um, you've got secondary finance companies that are on a national level and they follow what the big guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. From a, from a business standpoint, you know, when I think of, of if I put my, you know, finance, uh, finance lender pants on, I think about, um, and I think this probably happens to some extent, I may have some concentrated areas where I'll have a very good relationship with a repossessor and I can work relatively directly with them and, and, and maybe negotiate some better terms on, on uh, storage fees or transport or something like that. But then it's a good point because, you know, not everybody that, let's say I'm a heavy St. Louis lender, not everybody that I loan to is going to reside in St. Louis. People right. move, right? Yeah. The pandemic has been a big example of that. And that's, that's actually one of the things I want to get into next. Um, so, you know, I, I guess this, it may not be a question, more of a point that I think, uh, you know, whether you're a large bank or a small financial services company, it's, it's, to me, it makes sense that you would have some mix, right? Because we're talking about a network effect. You're just trying to get to the licensed, uh, repossessors that are closest to the vehicle so you can get it because time is ticking and, and, and father time always wins out, as you know, Jose, right. within, you know, recovery is, is, is is a place where you feel it really profoundly. Like we have a vehicle in shop and, and they're charging you, you know, some insane fee to, 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 to have the car stored there. And you can't, you can't go grab it because they've got the engine on the lift or something, you know? So it's just, there's, it's kind of the wild west out there. I, I don't know if sometimes a lot of the folks outside of the industry really understand how difficult it is to, to get all this stuff done and, and, and get that all put together. But Jose, we, I, I've had some some folks that represent the recovery industry on, obviously, uh, uh, a lesson day from the ARA. Um, and so we've talked about the impact that COVID had to the overall volume and the numbers for repossessors. Um, on the forwarder side, you know, what has what has been the experience? Because like I guess I think we were talking earlier, I really haven't discuss this with any forwarders, but you're obviously an integral part of the of the, the ecosystem and and you do feed through to, to repossessors as well. And so you're, you're, you're able to see a lot right there. Um, how did the, the pandemic um, go for, for, for your, your industry? Well, um, you know, it's first of all, it's, uh, you know, as, as, as we're seeing the job market open up and uh, and the economy start to pick up. The the repossession industry was hit very hard. I mean, from the standpoint of and, and think in terms of a borrower, pandemic hits in early March of last year, and the first reaction by any lender across the country was hit the brakes. Yeah, um, we don't want to be in the news. We don't want to be repossessing in the midst of a you know a national pandemic and a worldwide issue that's going on. Um, so the brakes were completely hit, and uh, and I mentioned to you that you know we're in we're recovering anywhere from twenty to twenty five thousand cars, and to go from that to zero overnight, um, and that's not just us; that's us and the whole supply chain that goes along with it. Yes. Um, whether it's the repo agents, whether it's the transport companies, the key cutters, um, everything associated with it all came to a screeching halt. And meanwhile, moratoriums were going on. Um, cars were at repo agent yards. Personal property had to be dealt with. Um, lenders wanted vehicles going to, you know, to auction. The auction houses were not open. Uh, so there were a myriad of issues that were going on. Um, but most importantly, I think uh, um, as you take a step back and, and, and look at the number one um, issue, it's the revenue component just dried up overnight. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, you, you take a step back from there and you start to kind of claw out of that. Um, and there's been a, a, a ton of issues um, that have come out of the pandemic, not just the fact that the repo business stopped overnight. As it's slowly come back, we're probably today, depending on the company, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent back. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say <clears throat> that the, the initial concern of losing anywhere from you know twenty five to forty percent of the direct repo agents in the marketplace, yeah, uh, we didn't see that. 
Um, you know, nonetheless, and you can thank you know, the triple P programs and the repo agents were very active in getting money to stay afloat. Yeah. Um, but the repo business is not back um, to pre pandemic numbers. And the longer we go without getting it back to the pre pandemic numbers, um, the health of the network should certainly be a concern out there. Yeah. Yeah. But on a state based level, I saw I saw quite a lot, right? So California, I think Illinois um, made it. Well, Illinois had a straight up moratorium. California said repossessors are not considered, they're not deemed uh, essential employees. And even though they are involved in transportation, so if I had a bicycle store, I, I remained open. If I had a motorcycle repair shop, I remained open, but not a not the ability to recover uh, collateral for the purpose of repossession. So um, they were kind of iced for a little while there. Uh, we're, we're through that. And, but I think, I think there's still a lot of eyes on state-based um, looking at these, you know, how the regulators are, are kind of viewing uh, repossessors and how we're going to kind of make moves forward because, you know, look, there's, there's inefficiencies built in, Jose, there's, there's programs, financial programs, you mentioned PPP, there's also the other stimulus programs, and we know that uh, employers in hospitality industry, in particular restaurants, it's becoming, I, I went to a restaurant the other day, Friday afternoon, they're open for business, uh, went there, took the kids for a lunch on a Friday, and they had a sign on the door, sorry, we're closed, we can't get, we can't get staff. Right. Just work. And, and, and you see these signs uh, presented on social media, et cetera. Um, I guess, you know, I'm just kind of thinking about, uh, you know, we had these state-based impacts, we have these, these programs, you know, have, have you or, or others thought about or discussed like when these things go away and once we settle in, what is the world going to look like? And what is the impact going to be? Like, I, I'm sure you get the question a lot, right? Are we going to see some kind of snake going through the garden hose or a, a golf ball going through the garden hose where there's going to be a, a repo spike? Do you think there's going to be one coming up? And if so, how profound do you think it could be? Yeah, and and, and the answer, the, I guess the question is, is it a V recovery versus a K recovery? And, yeah. Uh, you know, and 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 how quickly the uh, the volume spikes. Um, I, I can tell you what we've learned is is how much we don't know uh, from a predicting standpoint. And uh, you know, we we've all in the recovery industry been predicting since the pandemic started. I mean, it wasn't yeah. uncommon that uh, that I'd have a neighbor, somebody say, you know, you must be repossessing cars left and right. We're in the midst of pandemic, and um, and and it was quite the contrary. Um, so while these moratoriums are going on and the volumes are very low, um, you know, the question is going to, it's, it's moratoriums coupled with uh, stimulus programs, coupled with lender programs that are all that kind of that, and I, I'm not sure if it's a golf ball or a basketball that's going to go through that garden hose. And that's mm -hmm. really the question. And does it happen later this year? Does it happen the first quarter of next year? Um, does it slowly trickle through the system? Um, you know, my sense is as these programs start to abate uh, mm -hmm. towards the end of the year, the beginning of next year, we should start seeing repossession activity picking up again. Um, but I was just at an executive committee meeting of uh, indirect lenders for AFSA. And, um, and they're thinking first quarter to second quarter of next year. So while the repo guys are thinking maybe later this year into the first quarter of next year, the lenders are thinking that there could be a push into the first to second quarter of next year. Yeah, I mean, unless unless the lenders decide to make wholesale changes, which they kind of have during during COVID to, you know, average days to repossess. Right. So if you were normally repossessing on day 60 and then pandemic, you said, well, shoot, now I've got through no fault of my own. I have portions of my portfolio that are 120. Um, I think having contact, I think doing the skip tracing, I think a lot of that stuff is going to lead the way in terms of, of volume. Um, and, and I hope that we have people that are pulling that together and kind of forecasting, right, based on skip levels, you know, what the actual repo levels are going to be and, and how they're going to pace through. Because I think the lenders are largely in control here. It's, it's a matter of 
are they going to be able to to maintain with with carrying that many 60 to 90s or 90 to 120s versus saying you know we really need to pick up these cars and then obviously the 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 you know the the mainstream media would say well you know the, these vehicle values are are high now and so that's an incentive to the companies to pick up the car sooner i i've not seen that jose i've not seen that at all i think that's a false narrative no it, it's it's a false narrative uh, for for two reasons and and keep in mind that uh, um the false narrative is with each repossession that's coming through the loan the the value of the vehicle against the charge off they have record low delinquencies right now record low charge offs and so while i'd love to tell you that lenders are running out to repossess collateral because the used car market is high yeah money's coming through the door and your delinquency is down and your charge offs because every repo that you get is a higher value against the charge off amount yeah they're running record lows right now they're not running to repossess um now you know one of the concerns though that that should not be overlooked is is consolidation in the marketplace and what can happen um if that golf ball or that basketball goes to the hose and meanwhile you've got some consolidation happening at the at the repo agent level yeah and and that could force easily some pricing pressures down the line and so while while lenders are looking at how they handle their relationships with their forwarders or recovery agencies or or, or, or repo management companies uh, margins are a major concern here because as we look into the future consolidation happens you're left with less repo agents potentially in a market um because the business is just it's taken longer to come back than it should and that could create some pricing pressures down the line mm, mm. And that's a reality and so while you might say lenders are kind of in control um the longer the volume doesn't hit the market and the more volatility there is at the agent level yeah that's where the best ones that are left standing can control pricing more into the future well, and then if you hold off on the repossession and you don't have customer contact, as you know, Jose, then then that car uh, it's going to lose significant value, and 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 I think your 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 the likelihood that you actually even find the vehicle just drops right as as you let that clock tick. I wanted to I wanted to shift shift our thinking for this last portion to just thinking about the future. And Jose, you're obviously one of the leaders in the industry, and and you've 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 been in the forefront of of, of driving uh, a lot of this market development, and so I'm you know I'm I'm curious you know do you think there's going to be more trades of these larger operations, more consolidations, and 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 think I'm I, I'm curious about private equity if they're still um, in love with with the, with with this market. Well, it's a counter cyclical business and you know if you're a uh if you're a pe group and you're invested in in multiple business sectors and one of your approaches is to offset the potential for any type of mm. downturn then you invest in the recovery space and so my sense is that's why it's always been attractive uh, you know as, as kind of uh, uh the market heats up and you start to see originations and you start to see some of those pressures coming from the the compliance sector um that there are there's a handful of companies that are that are really reputable and good at what they do and so uh from an investment standpoint and the return standpoint certainly you can you can look at the repo space and who the who the clients are and understand that you've got a potential for a blue chip client base um that's not going anywhere but you do need to understand market conditions as uh as originations ebb and flow yeah yeah, we saw private equity really active on the on the financing side. I think there's a couple men still standing, but I don't see a lot of enthusiasm to get into the operator space, more so on the asset space, right? Can we can we just build up a portfolio and have somebody service it and we'll just right. strip the strip the yield? Um do you think there's going to be do you think there's going to be more consolidation? You know, what what do you think things are going to look like for the next couple of years, Jose? Well, uh, 
consolidation for sure. I think, uh, in fact, we just had a group out on the West Coast that uh, that was kind of like a co-op. It had put some uh, some repo agents together. That's right. And um, uh, just fell apart. And so while while the consolidations are happening, the question is, you know, can they hold on while the business rebounds? And as long as um, whoever consolidates can kind of hang on and, and get to the point where the business rebounds and, and ride it out, that's fine. But uh, what we have seen is, is, you know, coming together with small locally operated agencies um, and having multiple agencies come together from different territories um, is, is, is putting, you know, multiple businesses together. And, and I can tell you just from the standpoint of, of uh, consolidating a couple of businesses along the way, you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's no walk in the park. You really have to take uh, um, a conscious view of, of not just the culture, but how your business is operating. And when you put multiple businesses together overnight, all that stuff hits at once. And so mm-hmm. um, the success of those consolidations um, are going to come not, not just from making it happen, but ultimately how those operators uh, stick together and, um, and see it through. In the interest of, um, of, of now what's, what's happening, um, I can easily see more consolidation taking place uh, into the future. Um, it just, it makes sense. Um, and, and, and somewhere in there, um, my belief system is that lenders have a preference of just working with a handful of management companies, um, but there's definitely a place for the direct agent um, and, and the market has shown that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that one example that you provided is one where I don't believe it was an indictment of the model itself. I think there was other issues that they had to deal through. Um, so I, I, I anticipate there's probably some also rands out there that are 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 kind of building up to kind of cover that market. Um, well, we're 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 just about at time here, Jose. I, you know, I, for folks that are uh, listening, and you know, believe it or not, there's actually there's actually a good bit of startup activity in, in auto finance. There's there's companies that are growing and winning. Uh, we've seen some companies go public and do really well. Um, you know, for folks that uh, want to learn more about Resolveon and and, and and what you guys do and where to apply you and how your technology works, you know, what what's a good contact for them to to learn more? Yeah, definitely. Our website is full of great, uh, not just information about ourselves, but uh, we've got an insights tab that really takes a focus on on educating the industry. Um, at this point, uh, recovering another car more or less is, is not where it's at for us. Uh, we want to be thought provoking leaders in the marketplace. We work very closely with the ARA um, and making sure that, again, this is a business that's long lasting for all involved. Um, but learning more about us, uh, go to our website, resolveon.com. Um, you can certainly reach me there. Um, but I would suggest that you take a look at that insights tab to learn more about the industry. It can take uh, a rookie and give them uh, enough to be dangerous in understanding how to best manage um, portfolios today in a challenging environment. Yeah, I love the education aspect. That's obviously something that you and I are both very passionate about. And and I really like seeing the companies that have the wherewithal to do that, to provide those types of resources, because um, we're obviously all in this together and, and we have longstanding relationships and and you know it's just important to kind of keep the dialogue going. So so I, I thank you and the Resolveon team for that. And, and do check it out. They do have really good content on there, and it's it's not just uh, veiled sales pitches. This is actual you know education and good information. Jose, thank you so much for joining us once again. It's been Jose Mendiola of Resolveon. Thanks for being on the pod today, Jose. Thank you, Joe. 